Today we chat with Claire Waterworth from the Cosmetic Clinic in Queen Street to discuss injectables. We meet Mary and Graham Little from Cube Living to learn how modular homes are transforming people's lives. Charles George from Colonial Hot Tubs shares how to look after your cedar hot tub. We visit foodie and journalist Lincoln Tan at Hansik Restaurant for an introduction to Korean food and culture. And finally, Real Housewife of Auckland, Anne Batty Burton, shares another champagne etiquette tip. people come to see us at the cosmetic clinic in Queen Street for injectable treatments. We have a 15 minute consultation for all of our clients before we actually treat them and there are different types of clients that come and see us. There's obviously the positive aging clients and they're the people who want to look refreshed, they want to look good, they want to look like they've just been on holiday and all their friends will say, gosh you look amazing. We then have the beautification clients as well, the ones who want following a media, um, social media trend, who want the larger lips, they might want you know, more defined cheekbones or a really lovely jaw. We then have two other types of clients that we see at Queen Street as well. We see um, the transformation clients here as well, so clients who could be transitioning male to, male to female, so um, we really help them feminise the face. We then have the correction clients as well who may have a flaw, it may actually be something that they perceive as a flaw that actually isn't, and it's, it's affecting them socially, so they come for a bit of correction as well. So to deliver the safest possible practice here, we all have a really, really in-depth understanding of facial anatomy and the treatment process for each individual client. And depending on the product we're working with and um, the procedure we're doing for the client, we really, we really work with that client to get the best possible outcomes within a safe remit. At the cosmetic clinic, we are all overseen by a, a doctor who is a member of the New Zealand Society of Cosmetic Medicine. And she oversees all of the work we do here. She regularly reviews the work we do here and she makes sure that we're doing it within their protocols and their high standards. So when clients come in here, we really want to get the best results for them. We really want to tailor our treatment to suit them, to give them that joy, to give them that spark. So when a client comes in here, we'll give them full consultation and a good total face consultation. This client might walk in and they'll be looking at a particular line or a fold or, or a, um, a flattening off. And we'll look at the total face, we'll look at the cause, and we'll talk the client through really what they need as opposed to what they always want because sometimes it can be very different. And once we've done the full consultation, if the client's happy, we proceed to treatment. And what really gives me that joy and that little buzz is seeing the client walk out at the end of the treatment with a smile on their face. You know you've really hit it on the head. They, they have what they want and they're just looking really refreshed and happy. So the clients we see in um, clinic, they often do come in in their lunch times or in their break times, some come before or after work, because the cosmetic injectable procedures can be quite fast procedures. For example, an anti-wrinkle injection could take 15 minutes. Um, so it's really um, in and out, and um, then they can go straight back to work afterwards. It's really, really easy to come in and park in the city. There's lots of great car parks around and we always encourage our clients to go to the Victoria Street car park and it's literally a two minute walk from there. And we also cover parking costs for our injectable clients at Victoria Street car park.
Imagine a home that grows and changes according to your unique needs. Well, that's exactly what the team at Cube Living do here in New Zealand. And to showcase their magic are the creators and the owners of Cube Living. We have Mary and Graham Little from Cube Living. Welcome to the studio. Thank Good you. To be here. Great, great to be here. So great to have you both here. You yes. have such a fantastic story and you're doing so much for the housing crisis happening here in New Zealand. But first of all, first, Graham, I'm going to start with you. You're a builder by trade. Tell me how did you create cube living well i've been building all my life for probably for 40 plus years <laughs> it gives away my age a little bit but then we Maybe. decided about four <laughs> years ago there was a little bit of a um, shortage of housing so we thought mm. right let's help the young people get into houses mm. so we thought right we'll do some tidy tiny houses uh container homes to start with mm. but then i thought well okay we can we can go on from there and, and do module homes which is what we're doing now as well right so it's helping all sorts of people into houses, even, even well, uh, you know, it's just... Everyone you can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, even the medical we did. We did the big medical yes. container. tell me about that. Now, that was during COVID that last was COVID year, right? COVID last year, yeah. And what was that project about? It was for um, Dr. Lance O'Sullivan, who was the New Zealander of the year, mm -hmm. and um, he approached us to see if we could build him a medical container and we said, well, yes, we could do that. But he needed it in a time, great time, and we did it in 12 days. Are you kidding me? Yeah, we worked 12 all through the days. night. days. We worked all night. night we worked on a night shift. We worked during the and day. of course, it's an emergency service And as it well. was. Yes. Um, I had my hand in a sling because I'd had an operation to take the bone out of my thumb. Oh, no. So, so I was painting in the cast. And I was just <laughs> going to say, Mary, I know you, and I know that you are no stranger to hard work. No. And you are just as equally as hands-on in this business as, yep. as Graham as well. But it was amazing. Well, she's been working with me all my life, building yeah. life, anyway. Anyway, yeah. well, for the last 40 years, mm -hmm. and uh, she's actually <laughs> knows as much as what I do about the trade. So yeah. she's like a qualified builder, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've done your apprenticeship. <laughs> yes, I have. So tell me, when when you're working on these homes, I mean, you're you're not just – I know a lot of people might look at your website and they go, oh, they build tiny homes, but it's so much more than that. It is. Because you're literally able to use these modules to create a bespoke solution for every client. Exactly. How does that happen? Well, we do them in modules of six by three metres. Mm -hmm. That's a tiny home because that's basically one of our studio units. Uh, it's got a kitchen, bathroom and a living area. But um, apart from that, we can put three, four, five, six modules, even more modules together to make a larger house. Wow. The last one we did was uh, six modules we took down to Thames. It had two bedrooms. Three two, bedrooms. Three bedrooms, two bathrooms, two bathrooms and a separate laundry. So you can add on as many as you like to make a the size house that you want to. This is so innovative. Very it's so different. as well. It know? is. Oh, Very cost okay. effective. Yeah, yeah. I know people will be wanting to know more about that, but yeah. let's before yeah. we get into that, let's yeah. talk about fit and finish because I know that's something you come from a fashion and homewares background. Yeah. Colours. So colours, colours important. Yeah. Let's talk about when you're going into the design of these homes, what, what are you taking into account? I, I will do the interiors um, and I'm fussy. <laughs> <laughs> I also uh, have a lot to do with the outside of it too and Gray and I sit down and talk about it and – um, we come up with cedar or not timber or whatever we think might look great with that. Mm. Um, and the coloured windows, so much goes into it. Um, a roof, the roof colour. Sometimes we do two-tone, a grey fries and the black. Gorgeous. Yeah, Gorgeous. And, and it goes beautiful together. Yeah. Um, and then, as I say, Gray and I will sit down and ask a client, oh, we, we, ex we would like you to do it. So I think, right, okay, so Mary gets in there and boots and all. And, <laughs> and you do all that creative concept. And I do around. all that, yep. Well, and I guess with a modular home, you have a bit more freedom in the fact that it's yep. not your standard sort of, you know, home that you would you would design. But I've seen some of your designs and you'll have one piece in the middle and you're setting it around sort of a courtyard area sure. or a yep. swimming pool with two different wings. Yep. That's right. What's involved with designing something like that, Graham? Um well, if I talk to the people and find out what they want to do and how many bedrooms and how the, what, what they're actually looking mm -hmm. for. It gives me some idea, and then I just sit down and draw up a, a rough sketch, base, basically, to scale, mm -hmm. uh, give it to them. They tweak it out a bit and say, oh, I'd like that a bigger room there, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, okay, we sort of agree on a design. 
I get it drawn up by our design man, mm. and away we go. Wow. It goes to the engineer, and, and then the engineer, and then it goes into the council, and, and, and away we go. So you, you know? do everything, including yes. the council, um, yep. like all the sign-offs well, no that are required? no one wants to get involved No in one that. wants that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's too hard. 99.9% of people yeah. don't want to know about it because it's such a They don't want to know about it. Wow. Yeah. So it's kind of a, a complete solution. And... Let's talk. I know a lot of people are wondering cost effectiveness because we had this yep. chat prior to yep. as yep. well. Yep. I am blown away by the costing. So if somebody owns a piece of land, you literally talk to them, do the design according to their vision, sure. yep, and then you deliver that. Now, those houses are movable. Is that correct? Oh, yes. yeah, yeah. Um, once, Brilliant. Once they go there, they bolted down onto the foundations. The foundations are what they call a... a twist pile. It's this big screw that screws into the ground, mm -hmm. which is 1.6 metres long. And then they were all put in, they're loaded, they're loaded off the truck onto their foundations. And then uh, we just screw them all together. We bolt them, bolt all, them together. all together. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Yeah. What an innovative way to create a fantastic solution for people who are struggling to get into the housing market yes, it is. or for people who don't. I'm looking at the numbers. People yeah. are struggling to get those deposits right now. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So let's let's talk dollars because okay. I know, like I said, people yeah. are asking, right. where does that start? Okay. Where does the amount start? Yeah. yeah. Well. The new Plymouth one for a yeah, start. You're looking at yeah. probably um, a studio unit. You're looking at probably... 75,000. Stop it. Um, and then Amazing. you're going up from yeah. there. We did a six module unit for Thames. That one was uh, 330,000 <gasps> delivered to site. Delivered to site. And that's, that's turned out absolutely beautiful. It's everything. Beautiful. Everything. Are Two you bathrooms, me? Tile, yeah. tiles to the ceiling, everything in it. Yeah. yeah. It, what an incredible solution. And yeah. at a time where people, like I said, it are is. really struggling yeah. to get yeah. their own home. The good thing is, if people want to add later, we can always allow for another one to be put beside it, another module beside it that can be hooked onto it and the roof line fixed up accordingly. And if people want to move them later on in life, we can just unbolt them, Stop. unscrew and them out of them the ground, away. Yes. and they can be relocated <laughs> somewhere else. You guys are too cool. <laughs> you literally are super cool. Now, finally, Mary, what are people saying about this solution? Because I know you're there when those homes are getting installed. What, yep. what sort of feedback are you getting? Oh, oh, they're just so excited. Some of them cry when they arrive on the truck. With this last big one, we had um, three trucks and a big crane, and here they are swinging in the sky onto the foundations, and he was crying. He said, I can't believe it. Thank you. Thank you for delivering it. Thank you. I thought, great. <laughs> and it's quite amazing because people drive past a section in the morning, there's no house there. They come home from work, there's a house and there. And there's this big, wow. big my house. And there's no mess. <laughs> it's there's amazing. No, there's no and it is. concreting involved. There's no, no messy oh, mud around it. It's just a clear There's nothing. Site. There's wow. no mess. They dig these big um, screws into the ground, and because the um, stop digging people have a plan of, of the um, where they're supposed to go and where it's going to sit. So by the time they get that on, and people have gone to work and come home, and here's this big house sitting there, you know, wow. completed. You guys are so clever. I'm in awe. I am not worthy. You really are geniuses. And I think you've created such a wonderful solution for people to have their own place yes, to call sure. home yeah. finally. Yeah. Well, that's the reason we went into it, to help people yeah. get into To the, help people on, get into the their homes. Land, wow. I mean, not, as, as I was talking to show you before, um, not everyone has got that deposit, you know, and this one we've got going to New Plymouth is 189000 It's wow. two bedrooms, a beautiful bathroom, and I've, we've done this, um, I've done a feature wall in Aqua Stop. Aquarius. <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful. I can't wait to see the images. Mary and Graham, you really are a super inspirational couple, and I know there'll be a lot of home buyers out there who are saying thank you so much for creating such a cost effective solution yeah. so thank you guys i really appreciate Wonderful. it no problem thank no you problem. Thank and you. if you want to find out more about how you too can have your own cost effective house housing solution you need to get in touch with them head to their website cubeliving.co.nz mary graham thank you you thank guys you. Thanks, are money. just beautiful thank Good you time. great thank you wonderful So there's a few things you need to know about maintaining your hot tub. 
keeping the pH balance in your water is key for sanitation and keeping the filter clean will stop most of the problems from occurring. So how do you maintain the water in your hot tub? Here at Colonial we like to keep it pretty simple. Uh, a key factor for all sanitation is that if you keep your pH and alkalinity balanced, everything else should just work on its own. We favour bromine combined with ozone gas that floats in the pool. If you keep your pH and alkalinity balanced, everything else will take care of itself. Keep the, keep the tablets in your floater, the pH and alkalinity, test it once a week, uh, then leave it and it's good to go. So how do you maintain the wood of your hot tub? Well, we use a product called CD50, it's a stain. Um, your hot tub comes with a coat of stain on it. Uh, the manufacturer recommends that you put a coat on it, another coat on it within a month of it being in the weather. We can do that for you if you like. But after that, it's up to you as to how you want your hot tub to look. If you want it to look new, you'll restain it once a year. If not, you'll let it go, and as you, as you let it go, it'll just grey off like a deck does. So how do you maintain the filter and the pump on your hot tub? The pump generally takes care of itself. If the control is left on automatic, it will automatically filter and heat the pool to your requirements and time frames that you like. With the filter, we like to try and clean that every two weeks if possible, and that's just take the lid off the filter, remove the cartridge, hose it out, get all of the gunk off it, and put it back in. We give you a spare cartridge so that you can remove the first cartridge, put the clean cartridge in, and keep on tubbing. One of the most common questions we get is how much does it cost to run your hot tub? So because of the different sizes, hot tubs that we do, five different sizes, right up to two and a half metres diameter, 1.3 metres diameter, uh, it's a pretty tricky question to get right. But on average, you know, I'd say your worst case scenario is between two and four dollars a day. With a heat pump, you're very seldom going to be over a dollar a day. A heat pump is something we can add to any hot tub that we do. A heat pump is a small upgrade that will save you lots and lots of money long term. So where's the best place to put your hot tub? My personal thing is the further away from the house the hot tub is, the less you're going to use it. Uh, but that's dictated to by um, a specific design for your backyard, where the services are, so where your electricity ends up being, how much it costs to get those services to where you need them. So um, if you've got a design or an idea that you want, then you can put it anywhere you like, but closer to the house is good. If it's my personal preference is to sink the tubs in a deck, and we can sink the tub into a deck just the right height so that it doesn't need a pull fence. They look cool. Here at Colonial Hot Tubs, we're committed to looking after both the environment and you. We use the most sustainable, eco-friendly products you can use in a hot pool. Uh, that's our promise to you and the environment. To be honest, if you follow our instructions, it's simple, you're going to be fine. But if you need a refresher, give us a call or you can download them from our website. Well, good day, Monique here. Super excited. I am in Freeman's Bay in Auckland at a beautiful Korean restaurant called Hansik. And tonight I'm a very special guest of my lovely friend Lincoln Tan from the New Zealand Herald, who's hosting a special dinner celebrating the Korean culture. 
We're heading inside. This is for Elemental Auckland. Let's take a look. Come on in. Lincoln Tan is a much loved and respected journalist with a passion for people, great stories and awesome food. Lincoln's Table, a column he originally published in the New Zealand Herald, has also become a very popular Facebook group and page and has now grown into an events, marketing and social media agency that delivers clever campaigns providing publicity for restaurants and businesses in the hospitality sector. Most importantly, Lincoln brings people, food and culture together, opening up our minds and worlds to new experiences. Tonight's experience was the Royal Feast, a feast fit for a king, immersing us in a Korean culinary journey taken from the time of Tangun, the first king of Korea. The menu showcased a number of traditional dishes, tantalising our taste buds, and the entertainment was equally delicious, with stories and performances highlighting the Korean Kiwi connection. This evening promised food for both the body and the soul, and it delivered. So 15 dishes later and we're just waiting on our dessert. It was fantastic. What a wonderful way to learn about new culture and new cuisine through an experience like Lincoln's Table. If you get the chance and you see an event coming up, book a ticket and you have to join us next time. Absolutely brilliant. To Lincoln and the Elemental team, congratulations. This was fantastic. See you guys next time. Champagne Lady here, and Batley Burton, here with another few little ideas about champagne. Hopefully you're going to learn something. For those of you who aren't aware, champagne must come from the region Champagne. It's terribly important. So often people say, oh, do you like some champagne? And I'll always say, oh yes, and which one is it? And then we'll find that it's bubbles, it's not champagne at all. That's why I get extremely irritated when people will then say, oh, would you like some bubbles? And I'll say, no, I don't want bubbles, I want champagne. <laughs> so if you're a champagne lover like me, and you probably are if you're watching this, uh, that's something to always remember and just check on. And to be 
called Champagne, it doesn't only have to come from the region Champagne in France. It also has to adhere to quite a strict range of guidelines. One of them being that it has to be made from one or more of the three Champagne grape varieties. Two of them are red and one of them is white. So we have the Pinot Meunier, which sort of gives freshness and fruit. We have the Pinot Noir, another red grape variety, which gives strength and power. And then we have the Chardonnay, which is my absolute favorite, which gives effervescence, elegance, minerality, also uh, freshness, but really it's, it's, it's quite a lean champagne. It's not as fat as some of the others, if you understand my meaning. Um, it's just got the most beautiful refinement, elegance, as I say, citrusy characters. You often see the Chardonnay grape has a more sort of citrusy, lemony look to it. Um, the bubbles are the finest of all. And for me, it is my absolute favorite. So a Blonde de Blanc, which means white of the whites, that is 100% Chardonnay, rather than a blend or an assemblage, as they call it, of three different grape varieties. So the other important thing is, with Champagne, it differs from a wine. Normally when you have a wine, obviously it's a vintage, it's 2021, it's 2019, it's whatever it happens to be. With Champagne, it's always an assemblage. And generally for a really good champagne house, you who has, um, they have reserves of, of wine, because it's a still wine in the original state, of course, you will have at least three years of reserve, which means that, because people expect for champagne, a non vintage champagne to taste the same every year. If they get a Jacquard or a Tattinger or a Louis Rode or whatever it happens to be, they expect it to taste the same year after year after year. If it's a vintage, now that's another matter because that is the wine coming from one particularly good vintage. But otherwise, it's an assemblage of a number of years of reserve stock teamed with your current stock of, of uh, juice, wine, and it's blended to, and it's always going to taste as similar as possible year after year. As with a wine, as you know, you expect the wine to be different one year after the other because it's different climatic conditions and obviously the wine is going to taste different. And as always, please remember to drink responsibly. Cheers.